Hey guys, just wanted to read the beginning of Matthew chapter 26 today, just diving right in and following after the video that we did just a couple days ago uh, with Matthew chapter 25. Um, so if you want to, just grab, grab your word and read along with me. It's amazing. We can just open up the word of God and just dive right in and read together. And uh, so I'm just going to start just Matthew chapter 26 verse 1. It says, Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said to his disciples, you know that after two days is the Passover, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. And the chief priests and the scribes and the elders and the pre, uh, people who assembled in the uh, palace on high priest who is called uh, Cephas, and plotted to take Jesus by trickery and kill him. And this is Christ prophesying uh, what had happened uh, just right before and what was to happen. But notice what Christ said here too. It's the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders who assemble on high places looking to trick Jesus. And even though Christ, nobody took Jesus' life, Christ freely laid it down. He says, freely I lay my life down. Nobody takes it from me. But I want you to look at the uh, so-called chief priests and elders and scribes of today. Even though Christ is with us, within us spiritually, and he's not actually physically here uh, walking with us, they're still out there trying to trick people. They're still out there trying to defile the name of Jesus. So even though they're not, Jesus isn't physically here, and they're not trying to physically uh, take Jesus by trickery, they're still doing the same thing out in the world today. These chief priests, these scribes, these elders, these uh, pastors of the mega church, they're trying to twist and turn the doctrine. They're trying to get people away from Christ. And they're trying to defile Christ, to, to belittle uh, Christianity, to not tell the truth. And it's the same thing that was going on here when Christ was actually here. It's just different today. Uh, the, the enemy knows that his days are running uh, running short, so he's trying to do everything he can to even twist and turn the minds of the church, uh, even to this day, which it's, it's happening a lot. He's achieving that. But to take a look, at it's the, uh, the scribes, the chief priests, the elders, those who are in high places around the world, those who are in the mega churches, they're still doing the same thing. They're still trying to take Christ out and, and to trick and turn our minds to get us away from the true living Christ. That's why it's so important to get into the word and not only go to man. It's good to go to man. You can have, you know, your sermons, uh, studies, get together, but just don't let, have that be the only thing you do. Make sure you give God time, your own personal attention. Make sure that you're getting one-on-one -on -one in the word with Christ. We need to be uh, getting in the word with God because you can only truly uh, know him truly build that relationship with him know the scriptures when you're getting one-on-one -on -one and alone uh, in the scriptures with him in verse 5 he says but they said not during the feast lest there be an uproar among the people so the scribes and the priests and the elders they knew exactly what they were doing they knew that if they were going to take uh, christ uh, before the passover that there would be a huge uprise amongst the people because they knew what they were doing was wrong verse 6 says and when jesus was in bethany at the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him having an alabaster flask and a very costly fragmented oil, and she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. And, and in, back in this day, this is a custom to take a fragmented oil that could be sold for a lot that was very valuable and to put it on Christ was a very honorable deed. To, to get down and, and wash his feet, to kiss his feet, and to, and to dump the oil, the very high scented oil in the flask on him is doing Christ a very honorable deed and doing it amongst his disciples, doing it amongst the world, those who truly uh, were really important to Christ to show him and not only those around him that how much Christ really means to this woman, how that she's honoring him and, and what she's doing, a custom of that day is, is very honorable to Jesus. Verse 8 says, But when his disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? For this fragment oil might have been sold for much and given to the poor. And honestly, Judas is scary. It had a large part to do with this saying. Of, of course, Judas uh, Iscariot was the one that had an issue with the oil being dumped out that had to do with money. Verse 10, But Jesus was aware of it and said to him, Why do you trouble the woman? For he is, she has done me a good work. For you have the poor with you always, but me you do not always have. And that's why she was taking advantage of the moment. It's just like um, when Christ came in with Martha and Mary. And when 
one of them wanted to cook and one of them wanted to be there with Christ. And you have to understand that there's a time to cook and a time to be with Christ because Christ wasn't going to be there always. And remember, one of them said, Christ, Jesus, please tell my sister to help me. And Jesus says, you're, you know, you're always going to have help. I'm not always going to be here. So take advantage of the time. And this is exactly what she was doing is she was honoring the fact that he was there and taking advantage of, of, of the most valuable thing that she had besides, I mean, her, her soul to Christ, but taking what she had and giving it to Christ and honoring him there uh, because she was taking advantage of the time that, was, that, that she was in right then and there. For pouring this fragment oil on my body, she did it for my burial. So she was aware, she knew, and Christ still had that oil, probably still smelled like that oil during the burial because she was aware, fully aware that the that Christ had to, was going to go and give his life for the sins of the world. So she was doing it in honor as a custom for the burial. And I guarantee he still smelled like it um, while he was on the cross. It's a beautiful thing. I surely, I say to you, wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her because these are the scriptures. They didn't realize that they were actually living out scriptures during that day that we would have these scriptures and that every time the gospel is preached now in the world, it ties into the scriptures. So when we read today, even to this day, over 2000 years ago, we do it. And, and when we go through Matthew, Luke, Mark, we're able to come across this uh, moment in time where she did Christ an honorable deed and doing it, the memory of it still lasts to this day because the word of God lasts forever. It will be forever. It will always be. Um, Christ put the, his word above his own name the name above every name he put his word above it he says for surely heaven and earth will pass away but my word will last forever so even to this day when we come across um the gospels and we're getting over into uh the passover and right before christ had died this is a huge significant thing that she had done for him getting him ready for the bur uh burial so even to this day, we're, we're honoring her and um, honoring the act that she did to Christ by reading the scriptures. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, What are you willing to give me? I will deliver him to you. And they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver, which is equivalent to about $30,000 today. So imagine that walking with Christ, being with Christ, seeing everything, knowing that the true living God is in flesh right amongst you. You're part of his disciples and you sell him out for $30,000. It's a disgrace. It's disgusting. And that's why Judas couldn't live with himself anymore and why he, some of the scriptures say he jumped off a cliff. Others say that he hung himself from a tree and eventually fell. And either way, his body fell in the um, valley of the death is what it's called today and his body just ruptured up so he sold Christ out for thirty thousand dollars imagine that imagine selling the Lord God out for thirty thousand dollars you can't put a price on him you can't put a price on your soul uh, it's a disgrace but everything happens for a reason it happens according to his will he knew that judas was going to betray him there's a reason he picked judas to be one of his one of his 12 specifically because of who judas is god had a plan his plan was uh, come into the system of flesh die for the sins of the world in order to do that he had to be uh tried uh he had to be trialed yet even they were persecuting him and they were blaming him for um for crimes even though no crime and no sin was found in him so the the way judas was put into the 12 disciples worked perfectly in accordance to god's plan because he knew who judas was he knew that judas was going to sell him out for something cheap and he knew that there'd be nothing to blame the pharisees there's nothing that they could ever put on him so they had to have one of the 12 disciples who were with him try and betray him to try and make false accusations which never stuck which all works in accordance to God's plan. So he'd be on trial, lay his life down freely, even though no crime, no sin was found in him. So Judas being there and being part of the 12 worked exactly how God specifically wanted. God picked Judas specifically because he knew that this would happen because it had to be happened. It had to happen for his will. 
So from that time, he sought the opportunity to betray him. So he was looking, you know, he went to the scribes, the chief priests, and from those two days, he was just looking for a way to betray Christ. It, and that's the why it's a betrayal. It's not turn him in, it's to betray him because it's false accusation. It's not true. So you're betraying one, which means you're, you're making a false accusation against the truth. Verse 17, Matthew chapter 26, verse 17, it says, Now on the first day of the feast of the unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? Go, he says, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is at hand and I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus directed them and they went and prepared the Passover. And when evening came, he sat down with the twelve. Now as they were eating, he said, Surely I say to you that one will betray me. So Christ is way ahead of the game. He already knows everything. He's all-knowing. He already had a plan. He knew that Judas had um, went out and looked to betray him. And this is Christ saying so right here. So verse 22, he says, And when they were exceedingly sorrowful, each of them began to say, Lord, is it I? And he answered and said, He who, I, who dipped his hand in with me in this dish will betray me. And the Son of Man indeed goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man at whom the Son of Man is betrayed, for it would have been good for that man if he wouldn't have even been born. Think about that for a second. Woe to Judas Iscariot. It would have been better if he would have, if he would have even been born. Then Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? And he said, You have said it. And they were eating, as they were eating, and imagine how awkward that was too. I think Judas eventually, as soon as it happened, got up and left, but it doesn't say so in Matthew. But imagine how awkward that would have been if you're Judas sitting there amongst the disciples, amongst Christ, and Christ is like, one of you is betraying me, fully knows, fully aware. Who dips their hand in with me, and, and Judas Iscariot is standing there, Lord, is it I, totally knowing that it's him, and Jesus goes, you have said well. Imagine just how awkward it would have been for Judas. I probably would have got up and left too. And as they were eating, Jesus took the bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave to his disciples, said, take this, eat my body, because it's the bread that symbolizes um, the, the the shedding of the blood. It's the bread that represents uh, the body of Christ, the word of God, the true eternal bread of life because our physical bodies can live, uh, can only live off of uh, food for a certain amount of time. We have to keep feeding our, our physical bodies. But with the spiritual body, we have the true living word of God inside of us. We're truly satisfied. We're never starving. We're never hungry. We're always fully satisfied in the true bread of life, which is Christ. And that's to symbolize not only the breaking of the bread, which is the tearing of his flesh, the tearing of the body, um, bringing us all together in one spirit, even though his body was broken and, and, um, and lashed for our sake. It's the breaking of the breaking of the bread, breaking of the body to symbolize bringing all, all, all of us in by one spirit, one body through Christ and what he was going to do. But it's to symbolize he's the eternal bread of life, that nobody else can truly satisfy our soul, that his word and his word alone, because he's the true living word, is the bread of life that we need, the eternal bread of life that our soul needs. Because our physical body can, can, uh, will eventually die without food. Um, and just like our soul, if we don't have the true eternal bread of life, which is him, our soul will die. And that's why we need Christ. Just like our physical body needs food here, we wouldn't deprive our physical body with food. So why would we deprive our spiritual body with food? We got to feed our spiritual body more. Uh, it's more important than our actual physical body. Because a physical body dies away and it passes away and goes back into the ground where it came from, but the spirit lives forever. So you give the spirit the true eternal bread of life, it'll always be satisfied and it'll always be in Christ. In verse 27, it says, Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink it, all of you, for this is the blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many of the remissions of sins. Which is amazing because the, the, the blood came after, the wine came afterwards because the bread symbolized the body, the breaking of the body. The blood comes after, the blood symbolizes the true and righteous blood of Christ and why there's there's life in the blood. And, and we need the blood, we need to be washed by the blood because it was his true life, his bloodshed, him giving up his life for us. So when we consume the blood, we're brought together uh, by his life, by his blood, by the spirit. 
So it's the tearing and the breaking of the bread, which is the body for his bloodshed. And as we consume the blood, consume his life, consume the spirit, we're brought alive and we're brought together as one. And it's, it's the perfect symbolization of why we need the blood of Christ. It's his blood that he shed, uh, pure and righteous, innocent. No sin was found in him. The only sacrifice that God was willing to accept. And that's why it's the blood that we need. So when we consume the blood, we're consuming the life of Christ. And, we, and, we're, uh, and we're bringing ourselves together as one spirit, one body in Christ, all of us together. And that's why he did it with his disciples. To bring them all as one family. It was his bread, his body, the eternal word of God being broken. And once it's broken, the blood... Um, for his body's sake, because we need the eternal bread of life, we need the word of God. And then once his body was broken, it was the bloodshed that happened because it symbolized him giving his life for us, but there's life in his blood. So when we consume his blood, we're consuming and being washed by his blood. And that's what's to symbolize, and it says to symbolize uh, for many of the remission of sins. And they're doing that because he is the savior of the world. He came and took all of our sins on that cross. And, and to take and to um, drink that blood is the covenant that you have with Christ that he was doing with his disciples to let him to, to stand for the remission of sins of what's to come uh, of what happened in the past and the, and the new covenant that we're now in with Christ how we're fully washed by his pure and righteous blood that was shed on the cross at Calvary how we consume it and we're alive now in one body in, in, in one spirit by Christ and how that's a full remission of sins. There's no longer any guilt, condemnation, shame, and we're no longer broken apart from God. He brought us together by His bloodshed, and there's no more sins because it's to symbolize Him coming down and defeating death, defeating the sins for our sake. So remember that when He was there at the table and they were breaking bread, and they were, and He said, "This is My blood. Drink it for the new covenant. It's for the remission of many sins." That means that when you accept Christ and you give your life to Christ and you're consumed, and you consume His blood, you have His true living blood. You're washed by His blood, and you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. That means there's no longer sin. There's no longer condemnation, guilt for the sins, and you're no longer bound and tied to those chains of sin anymore. You're now alive in Christ because that's the new covenant. It's what God had originally. Um, it's not not the all the laws we one we break one of them we we break all of them is to symbolize that none of us are righteous not even one but now through his covenant we're alive and by his bloodshed we're alive and and we're free from our sins and that and and through him him taking those sins shedding his blood we're no longer in bondage we're no longer have the the penalty because we've accepted the blood that he shed for our sins Verse 29, he says, But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now until the day when I drink it with you in my Father's kingdom. And that's to come. I can't wait. It's after the wedding. It's for the huge feast. It's uh, after he, he has come in his second coming. And, and we're together in, in the house of the kingdom of the Father, together as one body, as one kingdom, having the actual uh, feast with him in his kingdom. Verse 30, and when they had sung a hymn, they went out in the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, to them, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. So they had to be scattered. And that's what it is, all going according to God's will. I mean, Peter in the garden taking out a sword was about ready to take on a, a group of Roman soldiers. They were... For surely, right here in this moment in time, they were ready to die for him. But it wasn't God's will. That he was to strike the shepherd to make to scatter the flock because Christ was to die alone. It was he was to go on the cross to die for the sins of the entire world, to go and do the will of the Father right then and there. Christ already had plans and already had um, things set aside for the disciples, but the disciples weren't to go with him. And, and that's why it's just to follow as God's word had originally said, he will strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter, meaning that they were meant to scatter. God had intended for them to scatter because they hadn't received the Holy Spirit yet. They hadn't received the Holy Ghost. They hadn't gone out and, and done the book of Acts. They haven't 
gone out into Israel and and had God wasn't ready for them to be done yet. God it was for the son to do the will of the father and that's it. So if it was the will of the father the disciples would have died with him, but because the father's will is only for the son to go and it's written, he'll strike the shepherd and the flock will scatter. And that's because it goes according to God's, God's will. But after I have been raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. And Peter answered and said to him, even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you that this night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And this is why Christ always, you know, is asking Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? It's always three times because he denied him three times. And Peter said to him, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so he said to his disciples, see, Peter was so ready. And that's because it, it, it doesn't matter how ready we are and how what, what we're willing to do is, does it go in accordance to God's plan, God's will? So that was verse 35. I'm going to go ahead and stop right there and we'll carry on tomorrow, verse 36, and just finish up um, most of the chapter, probably not the entire chapter just because chapter 26 is super long. But I just wanted to go over the very first part of, of this and the next part that we get into, verse 36, is when Jesus goes and prays in the garden before he's betrayed by Judas. So. Yeah, just I love I love reading the word. I love jumping into the word of God. I thank you guys for reading along with me. It's amazing that we can just open up the word and just read. And uh, I thank you guys. I hope you guys have a good rest of your day, a good blessed day. And we'll just jump right into the word of God tomorrow. God bless you.